On Monday evening, August 14th, 2000, at 5.20 p.m., I left Amityville, heading to India. This would be the fourth time I have traveled to India, and though it always is a thrill, it also requires a bit of preparation and long travel time. To prepare for the journey, I had obtained a three-month tourist visa taken malaria medicine for a week and suffered a gamma gobulin shot. I also packed a supply of Imodium and a mosquito netting for my bed. My initial destination was to be the ashram of Sri Satya Sai Baba, which is not known for its luxury. The flight to Mumbai, after gathering my luggage and changing my dollars into rupees, I took a taxi to the Kapinski Leela Hotel, a five-star hotel close to the airport. I was given a beautiful room and fell asleep in air-conditioned comfort. In the morning, I had a sumptuous breakfast and toured the lobby. One of the misconceptions about India is that all Indians are poor. That is not the case. India has a population of 930 million people. Of that, about 280 million, the equivalent of the population of the United States, live middle class lives with TVs, cars, nice clothes, and jobs. There also is a wealthy class, one that you see in places like the Kapinski Leela. The shops in the lobby made this abundantly clear. It would have been nice to stay longer, but I had to check out and take a taxi to Veracruz National Airport for a flight to put a party, the village of Satya Sai Baba's ashram. The traffic going to Mumbai International Airport was stopped. Fortunately, we were heading in the opposite direction. It was nice to see all the people going to work. We also passed a large homeless village. Mumbai is a place to find jobs so millions of people come looking for jobs. But even after finding a job, finding living quarters is even harder. The flight to put a party leaves only on Wednesdays and Sundays. The flight leaves in the morning and returns to Mumbai that afternoon. It wasn't always that easy. When I went to put a party in 1984, you had to fly to Bangalore and take a four-hour cab ride 
to put a party. The flight to put a party was uh, about half full, uh, mostly Westerners. And uh, I started thinking about the first time I visited India and I visited Puttaparthi a year later. In 1981, my daughter Susan, not yet 16, was chosen by the Amityville Rotary Club to be an exchange student during her junior year in high school. Her destination was India. There she lived with the Jagada family of Bombay. Anjali Jagada, also Susan's age, came to the United States through the Rotary and lived in Smithtown, Long Island for her junior year. In January 1982, I visited Susan in India and we took a tour through northern India. We stayed at the Rambar Palace, a Maharaja's palace, now a hotel. We stayed in the presidential suite, the same suite Bill Clinton stayed in when he visited in 2000. We rode an elephant to the Pink Palace. Susan rode a camel. We saw wild monkeys in the streets of Jaipur, snake charmers, and the Taj Mahal. I had only heard of Sai Baba a week before I went to India and was surprised while standing in front of Susan's apartment building, a holy man walked up to me and said, Sai Baba sends his blessings and touched my forehead with a tikka. In 1983, the Jagada family moved from Bombay to Bangalore. Anjali's father invited me to visit them in their new home, and I did. One of the attractions was that Bangalore is only about 80 miles from Puttaparthi and Sai Baba's ashram. I arrived on Friday evening and was informed by Didaj that he and his wife Gisela would drive me to the ashram on Saturday morning and stay for the weekend with me. The land surrounding Puttaparthi is barren and inhospitable. When we arrived at the ashram, I was given a room which I shared with another American. Didaj and Gisla were given their own private quarters. The ashram was quiet with about a thousand or so devotees staying there. I was given a room in the Round Building, a newly built building reserved for Westerners. The room was not furnished. My cost was 50 cents a day. Early each morning, people would line up for what is called Darshan, or Vision of the Divine. Men and women would sit quietly while Sai Baba appeared and walked among them. He would accept letters, manifest ash, which is called the booty, and sometimes invite people for a private audience called an interview. At this time, the Mandir, or temple building, provided a room where Sai Baba lived, and the darshan would take place in the sandy area in front of the building. The Pune Chandra is another large building at the ashram. It is a large hall with a stage. During the day, lectures concerning spiritual growth are given here. During the evening, bhajan sings and plays are also presented. During the day, there would be lectures and we would go out into the village also. The village was small and consisted of a few stores selling foods and goods. 
One day, my roommate and I hired a rickshaw and toured the area. The buildings surrounding the ashram were very pretty. They were schools built by the Sai organization, free schools. Today, the organization has about a hundred such schools scattered around India. The ashram had its own dairy. In the early evening, Sai Baba would again appear and everyone would gather to sing bhajans. Devotional songs praising holy people. I heard many stories about miracles that Sai Baba performed, such as healings, materializations, and vibhuti growing on photos of Sai Baba. I had personally witnessed the materialization of Vibhuti on the Darshan line. You could feel the love emanating from this man and the love in return from his devotees. I returned to Bangalore convinced that this man was special. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Futapad Theatre. Tonight we are performing the temperature outside is 30 degrees Celsius. Kindly remain seated and refrain from opening overhead lockers till the aircraft comes to a complete halt and the seatbelt sign is switched off. After an 18-year wait and two days of traveling, I finally reached Put a Party. Small buses were waiting for the flight, and soon we were heading to Prashanti Nilayam, Sai Baba's ashram. The amount of new buildings was surprising, mostly condos and hostels for people visiting the ashram. The village of Puttipati now was a long main street, complete with traffic and crowds. Soon we entered the ashram gates and were deposited at registration. I was given a room on the fourth floor of a new set of apartments that had been built. Now I'll grant you, it wasn't the Kempinski Leela. However, it was only a dollar a day and it was a far improvement from the first time I stayed at the ashram especially the uh, ceiling fan and also the shower. I would share it with Ralph. Ralph was from Munich, Germany. He was with a large group that had come to stage a play for Sai Baba. The area outside my apartment was like a college campus with a very peaceful and quiet environment. There were now five round buildings and many more apartment buildings surrounding them. Uh, the ashram could hold between 10 and 20,000 people at this time. Main Street contained bookstores, canteens, and other services related to the ashram. Photography of the Darshan area was now limited to those who received prior permission from Sai Baba. I was not one. After settling down in my room, I went to find my good friend, Dr. Girish Dixit and his singing group, Sai Lahari. One reason I came to put a party this week was because Girish had asked me to come to oversee the audio and video recording of his group when they performed for Sai Baba. Sai Lahari is a singing group based in New Jersey, specialized in singing Sai Baba bhajans of different countries. When I found Girish, 
his group is practicing a song called Aligato Sai Baba, a Japanese song thanking Sai Baba. Sai Lahari consisted of about 35 people. They had come to India to perform for Sai Baba, but to date there was no guarantee when and if that would happen. Ashram life had